Well, it looks like we are recording and on live stream. So I'd like to welcome everyone to our live discussion today, electric and hybrid vehicles, safety concerns and implications for emergency responders brought to you by the National Volunteer Fire Council. I am Caroline, one of the program managers at the MBFC, and I'll be your host today. I am joined today by a few panelists. We have Tom Miller, MBFC director from West Virginia. We have Joe Tebow, transportation specialist at the Federal Highway Administration, and Joe McLean, staff engineer for automated driving systems at General Motors. While hybrid vehicles are already commonplace, electric vehicles are becoming more and more common on our roadways. It's important that you and your department are prepared for the next incident involved <clears throat> involving these types of vehicles. Today's discussion will focus on electric and hybrid vehicle safety and considerations for emergency responders, as well as the future of vehicle technology and its potential impact. Before we start today's discussion, I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. Tom, do you wanna start us off? Yeah, my name is Tom Miller. Um, I've been an uh, adjunct instructor with West Virginia University Fire Service Extension for 32 years. I'm a principal on the NFPA 470 Hazmat Technical Committee and a Pearl Board Firefighter Instructor and a Hazardous Materials Technician. Thank you, Joe Tebow. Greetings, everyone. Joe Tebow here, Federal Highway Administration. I'm one of three program managers in the Traffic Incident Management Program. Uh, I've also spent the last 43 years as a volunteer firefighter, paramedic, and uh, chief fire officer here in Baltimore County. Uh, so I look forward to it as, as uh, the discussion before the discussion. This, this is a hot topic, and uh, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Joe McLean. Hi, everybody. Joe McLean from General Motors. Uh, prior to coming to GM in 2017, had a 24-year career in the U.S. Army, uh, flying helicopters and leading soldiers, including pathfinders that were very much, you know, fire trained and emergency services concerned. I'm leading an effort for General Motors now across North America, delivering training at no cost to first responders and second responders, really, to raise their awareness around electrified vehicle products and increase their knowledge and awareness of what is out there, what's been documented, and how committed we are and the rest of the industry are to ensuring not only our vehicles are safe and our product is safe, but that the first responders and emergency services folks know where the information is and understand how committed we are to their safety in doing their job when these vehicles or product have the very worst of days and the occupants in them need your help. So thanks for the opportunity. All right, well, thank you all. We appreciate you being here today. Today's discussion will last about an hour, depending on how many questions we receive. I do have some questions already uh, to start the conversation, but we'll also be taking questions from you, our audience. Um, so if you have any, please leave a comment or use the Q&A feature if you are joining us via Zoom, um, and we will try to answer all of them. So we will get started with Joe McLean, our first uh, question is taking us a little bit into the future. Um, as a staff engineer at General Motors specializing in automated uh, driving systems, um, you have a, a bit of insight about the future of vehicle technology. Could you speak to the goals of the automotive, automotive industry um, with regards to going electric and what new technologies we can expect to see on the roadways and how they may impact emergency responders? Certainly, I appreciate the opportunity. The advent of battery electric vehicles is not incredibly new to the automotive industry. In fact, you know, part of the training that we deliver is more than 100 years of uh, trying to get electrified vehicles right, the battery chemistry, the battery technology, all the other safety systems involved with uh, new energy and alternative fuel vehicles. General Motors has committed itself to providing the information for first responders, you know, for all of our alternative fuel and battery electric vehicles uh, at gmstc.com. And we've also posted all of those at the National Fire Protection Association's website. But the future is really exciting. And when we talk about electrification, please know that it's not just related to passenger commercial vehicles. We're also looking, and many others across the world and across the industries are looking at electrification in all forms of transportation, 
land, air, sea, locomotion, and railroads, the opportunities are really amazing to think about. And the industry and some of the lexicon and terms that we're trying to get into the first responders vocabulary and understanding is that we've sort of, the industry has sort of set on X EVs as the idea that all electric vehicles aren't the same. Certainly plug-in hybrids are different than hybrids or different than battery electric vehicles, different than fuel cell electric vehicles and whatever may be coming down the pipe. I'm really excited to say, and you all may know that General Motors is committed to looking at and safely deploying automated vehicle technology in the very near future as well. In all of our fully automated vehicles, SAE level four automation will be all electric as well. The commitment to safety extends far beyond the design, development, testing, validation that we all have our internal processes, just like every other automaker does, to collaborative approaches to standards making, recommended practices, best practices. You all should be familiar with the SAE J2990 documents. The origination of that came about around because we and others were creating uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, including the Chevy Volt, and the training efforts that started more than 10 years ago. This train that we're currently undertaking had its inspiration from that back in 2010, 2011. But the current copies and revisions of 2990 and all of the information reports that have been put out there are really showing the demonstration that the auto industry and the partners in the standards development organizations are to making this technology safe, not just for consumers and the occupants in the vehicles, but for the first responders. I'm happy to say that General Motors is partnering with a consortium that is doing work with the Virginia Tech Transportation Institute on a very high profile demonstration uh, project that is called Safely Operating ADS and Challenging and Dynamic Scenarios. And we will be presenting these uh, demonstrations in the National Capital Region next year. It's a Federal Highway Administration grant from the Department of Transportation. But General Motors is a best partner with first responders. And certainly we think there's strength and value in collaboration and clear communication, not just about our commitment, but the things that first responders need to know. These vehicles, whether they're electric or fully automated and driverless, your approaches are not gonna be so dissimilar to require you to buy a whole bunch of new equipment. You need to be aware of where the high voltage systems and where the battery packs may be located in the vehicle. And we and other automakers have committed to an internationally standardized presentation of that information on our published rescue documents and. They include rescue sheets from ISO 17840 standard and our emergency response guides. So if you're not aware of what those documents are and where the automakers and OEMs have placed them, certainly I, I gave you a website and something to look at from the General Motors side, but we've shared all that information freely and publicly at the NFPA.org site. I'd also like to you know, let everyone listening on the webinar know that there is free training that GM has provided a sponsored grant to NFPA to deliver their NTSB approved training. It's online. If you go to nfpa.org slash EV, you can see that sign up and it says free. If you use a code GMEV1, there's also a, a free grant from the state of Massachusetts. But that online course is free and we've targeted for rural and underserved communities and volunteer firefighters and emergency services across the country. So if you're interested in that training, please check out the NFPA training. If you've heard about what General Motors and our partners at the Illinois Fire Service Institute are doing around the country, please go to gmevfirstrespondertraining.com to learn more and look for training events that might be in your community. But the future is indeed very exciting. We think that the future is electric. We think there will be electric vehicles for everybody. And it's not just passenger commercial vehicles, heavy duty aircraft, you know, all sorts of transportation. I talked about locomotion and the, the idea of on sea as well. So the future is very exciting. Quick question from the audience and then I'll let the other panelists uh, hop in and see if they have any comments. Um, but 
Someone asked about automakers uh, only offering electric vehicles starting in 2035. Is that realistic or is that a myth? I don't think that's a myth. I think you're going to see increased mass adoption of this technology as a feasible, alternative, and affordable way to get yourself, your things, and your family, your friends, everybody to move around. Certainly, the average transaction price in electric vehicles has been up there because of only certain automakers and their price points of what they sell. But I think you all might know Cadillac is the first brand within General Motors to say, all of our new vehicles that are on the drawing board and what we're thinking about will be all electric. I certainly think that General Motors will beat that by 2035, but certain automakers for a bunch of different concerns and a bunch of different reasons are looking at the future of transportation as being electric. Let's not kid ourselves. Global emissions and climate change is not fake. We know that this form of transportation, gas powered vehicles and Exhaust lead to a lot of greenhouse gases and global warming, but the future of transportation is exciting. There are a lot of benefits as an EV owner myself. There are a lot of benefits to EV ownership, and I think you know no one should be afraid that there is going to be a future of transportation with all electric. But I think you'll see a healthy mix of vehicles being offered by many different automakers well into the future. All right, thank you. And does GM plan on putting out um, first responders videos? I know it sounds like Tesla may have done this. Uh, is that something you all plan to do as well? We've put, for, we've put videos in our two-dimensional rescue documents out there for public consumption. Certainly part of this in-person training and what we're doing is committing to delivering hands-on training face-to-face -to, -face to first responders in key targeted areas around the country. There are you can look it up. There is a cruise interaction plan with the AVs in San Francisco. That video is published out there. We are not the only automaker that is, is put, you know, information out there to be consumed. But people don't go to YouTube for your information, folks. Please trust in the standards development organizations. NFPA is the gold standard and really in the fire service. But learn what SAE is committed to and those established automakers that have worked in collaborative environments and with other automakers to really push the industry. That's what leaders do, set the tone and create the environment for the technology to flourish. Please inform yourselves on what General Motors is committed to. And I'm really excited to say that we are looking at an all electric future in the future, sometime in the future, but Cadillac will be our first brand to be all electric. Thank you. Any other comments uh, from our other panelists on uh, the future of electric or automated vehicles? On here. Uh, Joe Tebow, did you have a, a comment or question? No, I, I, I said none here. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you. Jeff, uh, Tom? None here. All right. We'll move on to our next question. Um, and Tom, this, this may be uh, for you. I had a, a similar one. But could you explain the difference between the electric cars today, hybrid vehicles, and then conventional vehicles? Well, as uh, Mr. McLean pointed out, there's, there's hybrid electric vehicles or um, which contain an internal combustion engine and an electric drive um, system. There are um, battery powered EVs that are, you know, solely dependent on, on the power that's in the car. There's plug-in EVs. The, the main differences are with a hybrid vehicle, you have both the typical fuel concerns of gasoline, motor oil, hydrocarbon type fuels, and um, the coolant system, you know, the ethylene, propylene, glycol, that stuff. Whereas electric vehicle, you just have, you know, the energy with the, that is within the power cell. Um, there are also hydrogen vehicles, which take hydrogen and then convert it to electrical energy. I mean, I'm, I'm not an engineer as Mr. McLean is, but there, there are some distinct um, um, differences. One of the things that, you know, as you look at the NFPA training and the NVFC trainings that are developed with um, General Motors is, you know, you want to first identify the vehicle. You want to look at badging, all that, uh, um, you know, it may be marked. It may 
the market, you need to be familiar with the different manufacturers and the marking, which again, you can get from the emergency response guides from each of the individual manufacturers. Um, you wanna take a look at, you know, look at a fuel filler cap. The fuel filler cap may actually be, be a plug-in port. You wanna look for exposed high voltage or medium voltage cables. High voltage cables are bright orange, medium voltage cables are typically neon blue. Um, but I understand, you know, being a first responder, you go out on the interstate in the middle of the night and the vehicle's rolled 11 times down the interstate, you may not be able to tell what type of vehicle or even what brand it is. Um, but there are key differences and there are considerations that you have to pay attention to. Um, so um, again, as Mr. McLean said, you wanna look at the ERGs, you wanna do some kind of risk assessment in your area, see what vehicles are, you see on the road and, you know, try and learn as much as you can about them. Great, thank you. And um, another question <clears throat> um, for Tom, what trainings or resources, and this could be a question for all three of the panelists, what training and resources are currently uh, available for first responders and department leaders um, who want to better equip their members when responding to uh, electric um, or hybrid vehicles? Now there's um, um, the National Volunteer Fire Council in partnership with General Motors developed an, an emergency vehicle awareness program that's available in the virtual classroom um, through the NVFC. As Mr. McLean um, stated, there's also the NFPA um, training. Um, I work with West Virginia University and we developed, took the awareness level training and took it a step further and developed an operations level class that actually involves, um, you know, practicing disabling a vehicle, you know, with battery disconnect switches and other things and identifying stranded energy. And um, with our class um, here in West Virginia actually involves a um, mock lithium ion burn using a uh, small battery cell pack that is the equivalent of about one three hundredth of the energy cell in, a, in an electric vehicle. We partnered with a National Alternative Fuels Training Consortium um, and have done some training. That's another great resource out there for um, uh, information on electric vehicles and their hazards. There's been a general um, fire service wide and emergency services wide push for training on EVs. Um, as you're aware, last week, the National Volunteer Fire Council did one on lithium ion batteries in general. And uh, we're working with, uh, you know, the towing industry and, and highway safety personnel on, you know, and as Mr. Tebow is going to talk about, you know, its impact on TIMS. So there's a lot of training resources out there. But again, I, I echo what Joe McLean said is, you know, look for your standards um, based trainings. Look at your, um, you know, your credible resources like NFPA, the National Volunteer Fire Council, um, the U.S. Department of Transportation, the National Transportation Safety Board, uh, the National Alternative Fuels Training Co Coalition, the Department of Energy. All of those have some great training resources out there. Thank you. Joe Tebow, uh, anything from the Federal Highway Administration that you'd like to mention here? Uh, no. Uh no, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that, and, and I, I may cross over and touch on some of that in a little bit. Okay. All right. Um, so we have a question from the audience um, about different thoughts on how to respond to EV fires. Um, Tom, I'll, I'll leave this to you first and then see if our other panelists have it, uh, any opinions. Um, so. Lots of thoughts on EV fires. One is to just let it burn out by itself, normally one to two hours. Uh, secondly, lots and lots of water estimated uh, at six to eight hours of continuous flow. What is the best method for putting out these EV fires? There are, there are different um, theories and strategies and tactics out there. Um, I would disagree with the six to eight hours of high flow. Um, on a passenger vehicle, the standard and a lot of the research shows 3,000 to 8,000 gallons of water applied to the battery. And that the key is applying it to the battery, not spraying it on the car skin doors or on the roof or in the passenger compartment. It's getting the water to the, you know, on the battery. 
battery. So you're actually cooling the battery cell and monitoring it with a thermal imaging camera to, to watch for potential thermal runaway inside the battery. Um, a key issue is also, you know, dealing with the stranded energy that's inside a battery that's, you know, especially a battery that's been damaged. Um, in our pre, prior to the meeting as we were chatting, you know, the tech, GM and other manufacturers build inherent safeties inside these vehicles. Um, the technology is there. What unfortunately we as first responders deal with are abnormal situations. The vehicle that's gone sideways into a telephone pole at a high rate of speed, the vehicle that's gone through a building, um, the vehicle that has been improperly modified or um, someone's not following the proper recommendations for charging. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of these different things, you know, exacerbate the problem. And, you know, there's a thousand scenarios, but the key is to get the water on the battery and to cool it and to monitor it. And then during the towing recovery process, monitor it for, you know, any arcing or any potential, you know, keep a thermal imaging camera on it while it's being loaded on a flatbed record. Um, I've seen things where, um, you know, a vehicle's being towed improperly with a wheel lift record. And what they're doing is kinking a battery that's already been damaged, which causes an internal short. There's, you know, there's information out there, the United States Department of Transportation, um, you know, Federal Highway Administration about the proper towing. Um, you want to make sure that you're following things. In terms of vehicle stabilization, which we all as firefighters do in a motor vehicle accident, you don't, you may want to look at the specific method of stabilization for that vehicle. You know, a lot of departments went out and bought rescue rescue struts or rescue jacks. You don't just throw those in there and start slamming them up against the car. You wanna make sure that you're stabilizing at key points on it that are, or that are on the structure of the car and you're not stabilizing against the battery cell. Um, you know, a strategy and tactics class is, you know, could be a whole, you know, weekend class. And uh, that's why we, we at West Virginia University took it one step further and turned it into an operations level class as many other people have done. And we've used information from the manufacturers like GM and Tesla and Toyota and Hyundai. Um, you know, the information, like Joe said, is out there. You, you just have to become a scholar of your craft. Um, you know, Joe and the Federal Highway Administration have done a great job in looking at its impact on TIMS and other things. And I, I give kudos to them and I give kudos to GM, not simply because they partnered with the NVFC, but, but simply because there is an effort to get the information out there. The problem is, is there's so much information. Everybody wants it in a, in a snapshot and it's not a snapshot. It's a, it's a full length movie that you've got to watch and, you, and you've got to train on it. There's hazardous materials consideration. Um, you know, a lot of the recommendations are when vehicles are involved in fire, you got to make sure that you're wearing your full PPE, including SCBA. Um, there's a, you know, when these things burn, they give off hydrogen fluoride gas, H HF, which is, you know, got a permissible exposure limit of four parts per million. Um, you got to be careful with this stuff. You want to make sure that you're wearing fire gloves and not extrication gloves because of the potential for arcing. Now, is it a high risk? No but it's a low frequency, potentially high consequence event. The, 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 the statistics on EV fires are significantly lower than that of internal combustion um, vehicles, significantly lower. Now, hybrids are a little bit higher, but true EVs, it's actually lower, much lower. But again, they're low frequency, potentially high consequence. But the consequences are greatly minimized if you have the training and you implement the right SOPs and SOGs to deal with the situation. Yeah. You know, the, the tag one to that, if you don't mind, you know, the fire service at this point, you know, some folks are saying, oh, well, this, you know, this is in its infancy. You know, we need to lean forward on this. And, and quite frankly, I say it's not in its infancy. It's still in the birth canal. We have yet to see what's coming. And our focus will, will, will tend to draw us in on the most, the most common types of events. I'm an operations type guy, right? So it draws you in on the most, your most common type of events, which are your passenger type vehicles that are out there. Most, those who have experienced a run to a, an electric vehicle fire, uh, it's pretty much been that, a, a passenger vehicle somewhere. But the onslaught of commercial vehicles now that are coming out onto the roadway, that, that's going to prove present a whole different animal and, and when we talk about suppression activities well once again everything that the fire department owns in the suppression world has been thrown at an electric vehicle fire 
to see if it would work. And we, we always come full circle back to copious amounts of water, right? So we got to get water. And, and like Tom said, you got to get water to, to, the, to the seat of the fire. And, you know, there have been some research, some tests on showing that if the thermal runaway in the battery pan has occurred and it's venting itself through its membranes or its exhaust ports, you know, you're going to have a tough time getting to the seat of the fire, right? You're, you're 80% or more of your water that you're throwing is being deflected and it's becoming runoff somewhere. And so it's really not doing, doing much, right? It might be keeping the surrounding cool, but... The, the events are, are starting to escalate now. I know the NTSB and one of my colleagues just responded in, up in the New, New England this past weekend uh, for a uh, bus fire, electric bus fire. And there's also a video floating around that, uh, of an electric bus fire that, that occurred in downtown Paris, right? And, and if you want to get a, t- take a look at, you know, how big and awful it can get, right, you need, you, we need to lean forward on the commercial size, side and, and not just focus on the, the passenger vehicle, but we're going to be looking at everything from buses, you know, Amazon's running them, UPS is running them. There are electric fire trucks out there already that are being run. Rosenbauer and a couple others have the electric uh, fire vehicles, emergency response vehicles. So they're, they're, they're all coming about and we've yet to really get the experience we need to know how to exactly deal with this battery pan in a in a passenger vehicle, usually the floor pan, right? The, the, the entire floor pan. Um, but but a, a bus, or, or for instance, it's on the roof. You know, it's a whole different animal. And we have to understand that when we talk copious amounts of water, that's one thing for the urban fire department, right? Copious amounts of water, heck, you know, you can't swing a dead cat without hitting a fire hydrant in some areas. But when you go out into the rural areas, copious amounts of water becomes a whole different issue. You're talking about tanker operations, tender operations, drafting from ponds, cisterns, water towers, whatever it takes. And from my, you know, my focus is the, 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 the national unified goal of safe, quick clearance. But we're talking about the, you know, traffic incident management. I'm talking about, you know, from the beginning when the event occurs to the end, when the roadway is clear, and there's seven points in between, you know, what can we do to uh, uh, try to meet the, the national unified goal beyond just shutting down the road? Because that's easily said and quite frankly, easily done. But you have to remember when you shut that road down, you're also stopping commerce. And when you shut down commerce, it, 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 we have a supply chain problem to begin with. Right. So when you shut the road down, things start to get ugly. So, you know, it's it, it's not in its infancy. It is yet to be born. And I, I think leaning forward on this, as all the organizations are doing, uh, is the way to go. You know, it was the same thing. Remember way back when, when airbags first popped up in vehicles. Right. It was a big, scary thing. Right. When you have to pop it into a roll of dash, do a, a roof flap or whatever it is. Right. You don't want those non-deployed bags to pop on you. And sometimes they did. So we'll conquer this, too. Uh, I'm just about ready to launch an electric vehicle fire research project for the traffic incident management portion, right? From arriving on scene to time to leave. So that'll be our focus area there. Be happy to share. It may even be tapping some of you folks as subject matter experts. If Let me know. push back on, on a little bit of what I wanna... said, Joe. I just want to, the, the characterization of an onslaught is mischaracterization. The idea of these vehicles being not even out of the infancy is also a mischaracter- mischaracterization. Well, I disagree with you on that. I, I then we, we can disagree. Well, this is a lively panel. I, yeah. I will tell you the information has been committed to by the industry across standards development organizations. SAJ 2990 and ISO 17840 are internationally standardized, recognized standards. I push back on your assumption that no one knows what to do with battery electric vehicles. And I will tell you, how many battery electric vehicle fires have you finish, fought Joe. in the past six finish. months? Please let me finish, Joe. No, no. The, yeah, the idea, you're, the you're idea that out there. it's this misleading. This is exciting. I'm enjoying it's this. Misleading. I'm enjoying. No, your your characterization is misleading, Joe. Boots on the ground is, is Joe, where we have, what we Joe, have to talk about. I, I would that's like my, to finish my statement. My you can talk over me. I, I am comfortable I talking to you as well. Finish his statement. I'd like to finish my statement, Joe. But your your misconception is fear mongering. It's not a misconception. 
I will, I will invite you out to any of the events that you'd like to come to and address the subject matter experts themselves. Your awareness or lack of awareness of the training and information that's out there is amazing. But I will, I will invite all the people to go, please go and look at the standards developments. And what you'll find is the approach to that you're trained on and that you're aware of currently in dealing with incidents to include traffic incident management they're not that dissimilar. They're not that dissimilar. You size up a situation, wow. you understand, you approach the vehicle safely. If you're aware of where those high voltage cablings and components are, then you wouldn't say those things. But please, I, I would like to push back. No, no, don't, don't please, because I'm standing firm. I stand firm on what I said, everything I said. And the boots on the ground, they, they know the difference, right? And if, if all these studies, that are being done, and I don't doubt, and I know that they've been done. I've, I've looked over many of them. Um, you, you should really try to include some of the operations folks in some of these things, the, the folks that are out there that are dealing with That's it. what we're doing, Joe, and going out face-to-face -face and getting people exposure to the commitment that we have, and certainly other automakers are welcome to do this as well, but giving people an understanding of the rigorous no, I, testing, I, I, development, and engineering processes that we have committed to making safe product. The better that's great. I, I agree with that. You guys are you all are doing amazing stuff in the world of electric vehicles. Believe me, I understand that. But once they light off, it's a whole different animal. And you know, a four door sedan is not an articulating electric transit bus, right? So these folks have to deal with this, okay? And, and they they're starving for information. What do we have? One hundred and forty three people on here. And, right, and, starving and certainly for information. The interest so, is there, indeed. Yep, we, we, we've got to do I, something about it. Caroline, can I add a couple things? Yes. Um, I we'll you move know, on to a different topic. Perhaps. Well, first off, I want to uh, I, I apologize for being remiss in, in mentioning the efforts from the U.S. Fire Administration and the National Fire Academy, and having conversations with Bruce Boach over there, who's, who's works with public outreach. The National Fire Academy has also worked very heavily on trying to get credible and uh, vetted information out there. Um, I also want to add, you know, when we talk about electric vehicles, you know, we talk about modes of transportation. When I, I did three days of training with the Huntington Fire Department in Huntington, West Virginia, which is a college town, Marshall University. And, and ironically, the day before I got down there, they had dealt with an electric scooter fire. And as a result, we were sitting there doing some conversations. And I worked with another city that has a major university in it. And their concern is what they call scooter pens where someone agrees to charge 20 scooters off of you know a couple 110 outlets with just a bunch of power strips. Again, I don't think it's necessarily the vehicle technology. It's it's you know people thinking, well, I took it into the wall and there's a battery charger here and that's gonna work. And they don't understand resistance and how that affects the battery charge and everything like that. So there are people also who are the end users have to understand the technology and how it is impacted by their use or misuse or you know, casually ignoring the manufacturer's recommendation. But Bruce, you know, um, Bruce has done some great work. And as you're aware, Caroline, we've done some stuff with lithium ion batteries around, you know, there's a lot of stuff. So in transportation, but also don't think of just cars and buses, think of forklifts, scooters. Um, I, I had actually had an email conversation with the folks from uh, Can Am. Um, and who make Bombardier jet skis, and they're looking at trying to come up with an electric jet ski. So, you know, the transportation, it's, it's a wide market. And I see where, I see where Mr. Tebow is coming from. I, and I understand that. And it, I am a boots on the ground kind of guy, a trainer. Um, but there are some, there's a lot of good training efforts out there um, being initiated. I know what's, like I said, not pumping up our own horn, but West Virginia University, we've done a really great job and the demand has been tremendous. But I, you know, I also understand where Joe's coming from. This information, is, there's a lot of information out there. It's just even for me, who's spent a lot of time on it, it's difficult to try and digest it all at once. And, and you know, I, I commend everybody for being on this panel and I commend everyone for, you know, your time to, you know, sit with us and try and learn. And I appreciate your patience as we agree to disagree. So, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Um... We'll move on to a question from the audience. And I think this goes to Joe T. Um, but 
you know, electric vehicles often um, occur while being recharged. Um, and these chargers are often located next to or on structures in parking garages. Um, how long until building codes, um, building and fire codes accommodate electric vehicles to eliminate exposure issues in, in the event of a fire? Sorry, I misread that question. So Joe T, if that's not for you, uh, we'll we'll give it to another panelist. Yeah, build, the, the building code, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure where, where the data comes from that most vehicle fires occur at the charging station. That That's a new one on me. I'm not discounting it at all, but that is a new one on me. Um, but you, you know, the building codes and where they're located and how many are located, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, that's a, a, a whole different, uh, uh, a situation from what I get involved with. Uh, I can tell you though, that is part of, uh, of, of uh, the, the Biden administration, administration's bill uh, for transportation, that there is an initiative to place uh, electric vehicle charging stations uh, like 50 miles apart across the nation, uh, no greater than 50 mile stretches on the interstates and highways. That, so there is that part of the bill where there are gonna be more and more and more of these things popping up um, I, I'm curious to see how, you know, you know how, how, they're, how they're powered out in the middle you know, of, uh, of Wyoming somewhere, you know, where you drive for hours and hours and see nothing, right, and not even a, not even a power pole or a street light. But, but, you know, that's the initiative. So there's going to be more and more of them. So it's another thing to lean forward on. But for right now, if it's a charging station on fire, no different to me as a transformer fire. Stand back, call the authorities, protect exposures, and wait for them to get there to, to control it. So, uh, you know, I'm sure it, there's a lot more to come on that. I'm sure. I, I'd like to weigh in on this, Carolyn. Um, you know, the National Fire Protection Association and the and the Life Safety Code have, has addressed um, lithium-ion batteries, and they they, you know, the the issue becomes on local the local authority having jurisdiction adopting the building codes or taking the information that is out there. Um, I would counter that everything that I've read statistic wise is the most common cause of EV fires are as a result of post accident, not charging. Um, and the ones that I've read, I've read a couple of case studies of fire marshal type reports from EV fires that were involved in charging and the thorough investigation found out that the, that either a B home charging station was not properly installed. Um, in other words, they, you know, didn't have a licensed electrician, did it, someone tried to do it themselves. Or B, there was some kind of other impinging factor on it, such as a surge or, or in one case I read out of um, California, um, there was an aftermarket battery was put in the vehicle, which was yeah, it was compatible, but it was not the proper battery for the car. But almost everything I've read shows that the largest cause of these incidents is post-accident or some kind of damage to the battery compartment. That can even be involved in submersion in water. Um, and, you know, someone gets a car out of flood water, tows it out of flood water, and then goes home and tries to charge it when there's moisture inside the, the battery cell, which, you know, moisture and lithium do not get along. So. Um, you know, you also run into this with the home solar charge where there's a bank of lithium ion batteries either in the garage or bolted on the side of the house. So this is this is not just technology that's limited to vehicles. It's it's out there. Lots of it, too. Let me let me communicate one other thing that is a misconception about battery fires and explosions. Certainly. I see a lot of you know media attention on exploding things. Well, I'll tell you that a battery, a battery electric vehicle on fire will not explode. I will tell you that the gases and any trap gas in an environment, whether it be inside a vehicle, inside a garage, that provides an explosive atmosphere and you provide a spark, that can cause an explosion, but simply a battery on fire, and, and if you need to look at some of the research on how lithium fires progress, certainly lithium ion batteries have been the predominant thing that have been in all consumer electronic products in recent years, to include the mobile phones, the laptops, and many of the devices that many of you are probably listening or watching on. But I will tell you that 
the idea that scaling that up to propel a vehicle or some other type of transportation provide, provided system is akin to scaling up the number of you know, cells. And trust me, add this to your lexicon, National Volunteer Fire Council folks and listening in, the idea of an energy storage system. That, th these things should not be new to you, but the idea that there are that is a fancy term for a battery of taking energy, storing it, whether it be from you know, renewables or something else. We in the automotive industry have taken a term to call it a rechargeable energy storage system. And there are some other terms like state of charge and kilowatt hours and things that you need to become more familiar with. But we know from lots and lots of research, both in-house and publish at very reputable fire service training institutions, to include some of the ones that have already been mentioned, lithium ion battery fires are tough to get started. They are tough to get started, and but once they go, they burn hot and they can burn long if they're not addressed. But a misconception about a battery electric vehicle on fire, we will communicate in all the training that a battery electric vehicle on fire will not explode. And if you don't know about ground fault circuit and interruptions and Trust me, the battery electric vehicle manufacturers have designed these vehicles to be safe and the chassis is not energized from the battery. There are a number of instances in J2990, SAE J2990, the automakers are encouraged to implement in high voltage disconnects. And certainly one of those is during a crash sequence when the airbags are deployed, when the vehicle is turned off, when the 12 volt cut loop is severed or a manual disconnect. But again, we're trying to provide the information that's out there and dispel some of the misconceptions and the fear around this new technology. Because again, it's not just commercial or passenger vehicles. Like Joe Tebow said, there are heavy delivery trucks. We've certainly invested in a company called Bright Drop. We, it's our own product, but selling electric delivery vans to fleet customers now. And you'll see them in all other modes of transportation in the near future. So please increase your understanding and awareness of what's been published and what's out there. And if you have questions, reach out to subject matter experts, not just in the fire service, but cross collaboratively to address some of your concerns or questions. One thing I would like to tell you all is that in addition to the two dimensional rescue documents that we've published for all of the battery electric vehicles and our reference to one of the links that I posted you know, in the chat, we're exploring alternative presentations of information. Certainly vehicle telematics and vehicle data, you know, our OnStar brand has a tremendous amount of information. If you get an OnStar call, you can get all types of, you know, number of occupants, the severity of the injuries that are predicted to be in, what type of collision it may have been in or what type of crash. If you don't know to ask dispatch to ask OnStar if you're an OnStar call, that's something we try to address in the training. OnStar can also tell you if it's an electric vehicle that's been involved as well. But we're looking at alternative presentations of information that aren't just two-dimensional, that you need to go to a website or download to your mission command tablet or your screens or print out in booklets, but having something that is actionable and timely so you can size up a situation perhaps en route to the scene and help your mission commanders and on-scene commanders really develop the situation in a timely way. So thanks for letting me say that. Thank you. Uh, we'll bring it back to the exploding batteries because that was a question in the audience. Um, Tom or Joe T, uh, any any other comments that you'd like to make on on that? Uh, personally, I, I I think the information given you know is spot on. Yeah, as Joe pointed out. Any explosion, whether you know, be from a round of ammunition and a gun, or you know, some kind of you know um, device, is a is based on pressure. And you know, when the, when a battery cell, you know, is compromised in a certain manner, there can be torching, there can be you know, force venting. Um, and there is a, you know, again, a very small chance of some type of pressurization event, which can, which can result in fragmentation. Is it going to blow up the car like you see on Hollywood? 
No, not even close. And and in the you know in the test burns that we do as part of our course, you know the the batteries have to be damaged, severely damaged. We you know literally take and smash them with a hammer. There are internal controls, and I pointed that out earlier. People need to realize there's all kinds of fail safes there. Um, um, yes, you're going to have a fire, and like he said, it's, it's going to burn hot. It, it's going to burn, and it's going to generate heat, a lot of heat. You know, temperatures 1400 degrees. You know, and anytime you keep that kind of fire in, you know, confined in a battery cell or in a battery compartment, or you know, you know, one incident I read about, you know, when they looked at it post incident wise, is you know, mud had gotten up into vent holes on the battery which, you know, allowed internal pressure to build up because the car was involved in an accident. Um, there, I, I have to echo what, what Joe and Joe both said, you know, look at, look at the, the research that's out there. Look at the, the studies. Yes, you're going to have a big fire and you're going to see, you know, you may see some, um, you know, pretty powerful venting and torching. Um, but is the car going to blow up, you know, and like, you know, in a James Bond movie? No, that's not going to happen. <laughs> uh, no, we've, you know, I've, I've, I've been a part of a bunch of burns and, and that just hasn't, I haven't seen that at all. Um, even on, you know, you're going to see some, I, don't, I seem like I'm rambling here, but I just want to make sure that you understand is you, the key is to get the water to the seat of the fire as a, uh, Mr. T. Bell pointed out, you got to get you got to get it to the root. Um, and a lot of people think, well, you know, we slung thousands of gallon of water on it, but you know, it never got to the fire. It's just like shingles on a house. You know, it doesn't know the difference between rainwater and the water coming out of a fire hose. So um, I echo what Mr. McLean said. There, you're not going to see an explosion. Right. And I've, done, and I've done a bunch of burns, <laughs> a bunch. <laughs> so. Um. We, we've had quite a few questions about departments and counties and municipalities really wanting hands-on in-person training. Um, is there any, are there any trainings where um, this is offered that you all know of? Could you send uh, participants? <laughs> Probably not, but, but somewhere where they'd be able to find out more about an in-person training and bringing it to their location. Um, West Virginia University um, Fire Service Extension has been doing trainings, and you can contact um, if someone wants to send you an email, Carolyn, at the NBF State, put them in touch with us. I know that other entities are doing um, in-person training, and Carolyn's probably going to smack me and throw something at me and hit me, but the NBFC is actively working on um, how we can get some in-person trainings out to regional um, partners, we're, you know, we're, we're aware of the, the need and the desire to get these types of trainings out. We're, um, in fact, we're going to be going, uh, myself and some other folks are going to the Georgia State uh, Firefighters Association here September 30th in Columbus, Georgia. Write that down, September 30th in Columbus, Georgia, uh, down there with Dave Bullard and the bunch um, right outside of Fort Benning. And we're going to be doing an in-person operational level class down there if people want to come. I know that uh, GM and other partners are working with uh, NFPA and other fire service organizations. This is a this is like an all all hands in full court press. Uh, I know Joe Tebow there, the Federal Highway Administration is working with different entities. They've I've been talking to folks at the Responder Safety Institute. I've been talking to folks at you know at uh, different fire colleges. Uh, been talking to some folks up at FASNI up in New York, the Firemen's Association in the state of New York. So just keep your heads up, pay attention to your social media, pay attention to your, uh, you know, your training educational channels and pay attention to the NVFC because I think you're going to see some stuff coming out of us that, that you'll be pleased with. I will tell everyone listening and, and online today, our training site is up gmevfirstrespondertraining.com. There is a link with a bunch of additional resources, links to SAE, links to the NFPA, links to commitments to electrification and vehicle safety. Please make yourselves available to that. And if you can sign up for any of our in-person face-to-face training, 
that we're going across the country, please look to come to that. Certainly we can't go to every single fire department, firehouse, but we do appreciate and understand the value of in-person face-to-face training and providing you all access to subject matter experts from within the company and across the fire service, delivering this collaboratively to communicate to you that we take the safety of our product and your safety in doing your jobs very, 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 very importantly. So please avail yourself of the resources that are there. If you have time to come in person, please look to sign up for one of those in-person trainings that will be in, in metro areas, but certainly the two train deliveries that we've had thus far, we've had people come from over 500 miles away. I know that people from all over the world are interested in this training. We would love to get the information in all of your hands and that website is where we intend to put our delivered training as a recording or a video, but really understand the importance of face-to-face, -face, hands-on exposure, awareness, and increasing the education levels for all the first responders. We know that the volunteer fire service is the majority of folks in this country, very different from other fire services and emergency responders around the world have nationalized efforts, but we are committed to that. We are committed to delivering high quality, you know, training with accredited partners and getting information out there so you don't fear or you don't have angst addressing vehicles in the worst of situations and that might happen to be a battery electric vehicle. Great, thank you. Um, a question for the group. Well, I guess this is a question for GM, but anyone else is welcome to, to respond as well. But is there an app for first responders that could be used when responding to um, electric vehicles and, and um, to know what type of vehicle uh, they'd be responding to? tell you that there is just not in the United States there the European new car assessment program you know run by the European Union mandated that all automakers that sell vehicles in that region provide those rescue sheets I put I told you guys all about the rescue documents that we've made publicly available the Euro NCAP the new car assessment program in Europe is mandated that anyone selling product there needs to provide them with these rescue sheets, again, in an internationally standardized format, and they have an app. It's called the Euro, the Euro Rescue app. And many first responders that we've talked to in these training deliveries are aware of that and they've got it downloaded on their phones. But no, there is not an app you know, available here in the States. And we look to other industry partners and in, you know, in consortia, as well as the federal government to invest in and look at the potential for presentation of timely and accurate information whether it's traffic incident management with battery electric vehicles or anything else, but no, there's not an app, but that's part of the training that we're delivering and gathering feedback on with alternative presentation of information, not just the printed documents or the PDFs that we and other automakers have posted. Um, I echo what Joe said. There's not a, a, a particular app out there, but there are repositories that have all of the emergency response guides for all the different vehicles on them. Now, is it quick and easy to use or as user-friendly as it could be potentially? No, but there are um, websites out there that have um, the uh, various ERGs, um, emergency response guides for the different vehicles. Uh, and if you send Caroline an email or Matt an email, um, I'll work on getting, I can get that back out to you. Yes, and we've had a few questions about resources, so we will um, include the links to our resources, the uh, MVFC's electric vehicle course, uh, GM site, MVFC site, and uh, the Federal Highway Administration after uh, this event ends. Uh, so hopefully you'll be able to locate all the resources that you need um, afterwards. Um, we are getting close to one hour, but we'll try to answer a, a few more questions here. Um, there was a question about um, where can you find information concerning electric vehicle and magnesium engines when fighting fires? Can anyone speak to that? You have to understand magnesium is a, bur is a metal that will burn. It burns hot. Um, it's, it's, 
the propensity to for them to to burn again in an EV again the frequency of EV fires is much less that than of an internal combustion engine or a hybrid vehicle. Um, but it's it goes back to what I mentioned earlier. You have to do a risk assessment. Are your people properly trained in how to deal with a magnesium fire? You're going to deal with magnesium fires on wheels, on transmissions, and internal combustion engines. Uh, magnesium is a common vehicle component. Um, I it doesn't to me as a first responder with you know almost 40 years experience. It, it's it, it does pose an extremely high hazard for me. Both you know if we all remember. Joe's like me, he's got a lot of gray hair. You probably remember the old Volkswagen Beetles, you know, you attack a rear engine fire and watch watch the spark show. It's um, magnesium has been around in engines and vehicles, you know, since almost World War II. So, mag wheels, uh, mag wheels. <laughs> you mag wheels, yeah. You know, uh, so um, again, you know, water and magnesium fires don't get along. You know, it's like water and sodium metal fires don't get along. You know, lithium doesn't, you know, lithium, you know, is a, is not found freely in nature. You're not, it, it's a, you know, one of those metals that just doesn't like water. Uh, you know, it's atomic element number three. So um, just treat it like you would treat a, a magnesium engine fire on a Volkswagen. And I'm not saying Volkswagen is more propensity, has a greater propensity to burn than something else, but you're, you're going to have to, you know, again, look at your training and your SOPs. How are you going to deal with them? You know, you're going to use you know, Metal X or Purple K on it, you know, what do you carry? You know, again, make a risk-based decision. If you believe it's high risk, you're going to have to prepare for it. And, and, and the time, you know, the, the time, time that you're going to be there. You know, you can, it, it, it's all it, almost an, an automatic given that you, you're going to be there a while, right? And remember from the traffic incident management standpoint, right? We, we've trained over 600,000 first responders. And traffic incident management, right? And, and we're shooting for a million is our goal, and then we'll continue on. Um, and, and we're going to add an element once we finish this research and, and, and get some information together. But our our concerns are, uh, or or where my focus area is, is the longer responders are out there dealing with this, right? The, the greater the the risk, you know. And and what we what we want, you know, is is to come up with uh, a consensus because the traffic incident management program as it stands right now, you know, is built by responders for responders, right? And, and, and that, that's, you know, that, that's the, the mindset and, and, and the expertise, you know, that we bring, bring to the table every time, you know, we meet to, to, to discuss this and to have an SOP to, to come up with a process because it's not, you, you know, it goes even deeper. The, the vehicle can be, if the vehicle's extinguished, the vehicle has been extinguished. If it's rolled onto a, a rollback to be towed away, I hope they don't hook it up to, to a, a hook in the back to, to transport it by dragging it because movement of the wheels may very well inspire a thermal runaway if there's damage in, internally. But they caught on fire while they're on the rollback traveling down the road on their way to the storage facility. And then once at the storage facility, they've reignited there as much as two weeks later, just sitting in the yard. Now the recommendation in the towing and recovery industry is to isolate those electric vehicles that have been damaged, whether they've been on fire or not, if they've been damaged, to isolate them in their storage yards with a 50 foot buffer. Now, you know, the, the, the towing and recovering industry is like, whoa, 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 how? So they're building concrete barriers. They're stacking Jersey walls in order to store these things, you know, a three wall bin, so to speak, right? To store these vehicles because they know they will reignite. Uh, there have been times where the, the, the facility has dug a pit and put the vehicle in a pit in the ground because they had the luxury of, of, of a dirt area and they've dug a pit. So, you, you know, what, what, what we focus on is that, is that traffic incident management timeline. Right from the, the time of the occurrence to the roadways open and everything's gone and it, it's all good again. And in between there are where our responders are going to be fighting this fire, throwing what they have at it in rural areas, you know, tanker tender task forces, you know, portable water dumps. You know, it, it, it could go on for hours and hours depending on what type of vehicle it is. 
And then again, where is it? If it's on the interstate, exposures are minimal. If it's in downtown, whatever, it's a whole different animal. So, you know, that's our focus is, is, is to do what we can to come up with a, meth, a methodology of reducing the risk to responders as they're out there on the roadways dealing with these things. And I want to add, you know, and I'm, and I'm certainly, I've, I've, I've been through the Tim's program and a training trainer. People don't also don't understand the why you keep a road shut down. It's not just the hazard to commerce. It's also the hazard to traveling public because sure. he, I hate to say this. Sometimes people start doing stupid things when the road's backed up. They try and turn around where they shouldn't turn around. And, and you know, there are other hazards that could be factored into it, you know, whether it's on an elevated roadway or underneath an elevated roadway. Um, um, and on a limited access highway where you can't get water supply, there's no hydrants along interstates and things like that. But, you know, that's why you need to do, I stress this again, if this will be the fourth time I've said this, do a risk assessment. What can you do? Can you extinguish the fire to the point where you can load it on a rollback, take it down to the park and ride, get it off the road and monitor it there? You know, nothing says you can't move your incident or get it to the to the salvage yard and do your monitoring there. The monitoring doesn't have to necessarily occur. And I, I know I'm going to get all kinds of feedback from volunteer fire departments. We can't spend that much time because we're volunteers. We got to go back to work Our time. We're not getting paid for this. Um, you know, you have, again, you have to do the risk assessment. You have to make sure that you're, you're implementing the right strategies and tactics based on what the situation you're dealing with. I can't stress this enough, risk-based approach. Again, these are very low frequency. Now, I understand where Joe's coming from. They, they, they do tend to be high consequence events, but they're very low frequency. But, you know, the, 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 that low number is still you know, 30 or 40 incidents a day across the United States. And as the number of electric vehicles go on there, that could go up. But again, these are, most of these incidents, our biggest problem is dealing with this thing when it's been in an auto accident, not because of how it was built, how it, it's how the end product ended up. You know, I, I read one report where a guy went, went, was going 130 miles an hour sideways into a telephone pole. Folks, that's good. That's an incident that's going to generate bad consequences. It doesn't matter if you're driving a, an M1 Abrams tank or, or you know, a Chevrolet. That's a bad event. And, you know, we as firefighters, we deal with, we're in the bad event department. And you got to do, you got to do the risk assessment. You got to have SOPs and SOGs. You got to make sure that you look at the risk. You got to make sure you take the training. If, you, if you're so concerned about it, make the training a priority. Make the training a priority. Don't awfulize it. Grab it by the horns. Sit there. You know, Tim's came about as a direct result. And it's, you know, it, it, the, the data, sadly, is showing that we're more at risk from being struck. The longer we're on that highway than we are from dying in a house fire, we're, we're greater at risk of totaling a $400,000 or $500,000 pumper because we've shut the roadway down because of distracted drivers than we are from the actual incident itself. So when you look at from Tim, from Joe's perspective and Tim's perspective, are we making a bigger problem by trying to fix this problem? And from Mr. McLean's perspective, are we wanting to blame the vehicle or how the vehicle ended up? Well, I don't blame the vehicle. You know, the vehicle's... <laughs> I've seen, you know, in researching the, the program that we built with GM, I've seen the safety programs are in there. And Joe's right. There are all kinds of safety standards. I'm more concerned about the 2004 hybrid vehicle that's out there rolling on the road before all these standards and all this was looked at, because that's statistically where the problems are laid, not the new ones that are coming out. It's the ones that came out before there were standards, whenever, before there was a, a general industry-wide consensus you know, to take a look at it. And I, and I'm, please, I'm not a spokesman for GM, but I commend GM and the other manufacturers, Tesla, Toyota, BMW of North America that have worked to get safety information out. And it's not, it's industry-wide. Are we going to be able to answer everybody's concern? No, no, we're not, you know, but we've got, we've got to deal with what we have. And it's, it's a reality that we're dealing with, you know, and like, 
like Joe pointed out early on, it's a literally a reality that was around before gasoline engines, electric vehicles were the first vehicles out on the road. Uh, they just had a really crappy battery system. No offense to the manufacturers, Joe, but you just didn't have the battery technology there to make it worthwhile. Yeah. <laughs> Thomas Alva Edison and Henry Ford looked at, you know, battery electric vehicles for their quiet use of operation, their efficiency, ease of use. It was a luxury thing. And then Ransom Olds. Ransom Olds old spent a lot, a lot of time on it. Yep. Those, those were mainly wet cell batteries, weren't they, Joe? They yep. had a vastly different chemistries and, and, and things that were available in the mid 1800s and early 1900s. But yeah, certainly battery technology has progressed eons, right? And so in part of this training, uh, we talk about and remind people that General Motors had put a battery electric vehicle on the moon in the early 70s, you know, in conjunction with NASA and Boeing. And we're partnering with Lockheed Martin right now to put another battery electric vehicle on the moon in space with the Artemis program. So electrified propulsion and alternative fuel vehicles are new to many people. The standards and recommended practices, best practices, there has been industry consortia and symposia and other things that have consolidated on those recommended and best practices. I encourage you all to reach out and come to any of these trainings in person, look at the resources that are available, look at the published research from the credible fire research and fire rescue institutions around the world. But there is a lot of effort in not just standardizing the presentation of that information. Again, it's starting with ISO 17840 and making that information available um, to first responders, but we think there could be an evolution that could be led here in the United States with American ingenuity and American innovation in alternative presentations on timely information complemented with vehicle telematics or other dispatch and certainly you know, two-way communication, whether that's by voice or by video. So there are a lot of innovations that are spurred by the advent of new technologies. And please understand how committed we and others who are putting battery electric vehicles on the road are committed to their safety and your safety. Thank you. Copious amounts of water. I, I saw a question in the chat from an insurance adjuster who talked about how can, you know, is there identifying a placardy? And again, I would refer you to the NFPA website or the NBFC's training. We talk about badging and what to look for. Um, our training on a virtual classroom um, has a whole couple slides about, you know, based on the NFPA thing of identify, immobilize, and disable, talking about the badging. Um, but I would also point out sometimes if the vehicle's rolled or been catastrophically damaged by fire, you're not going to see that. Um, you know, I, I was on a fire department for... 37 years that covered 20 plus miles of interstate and up to their subcomponent parts. But, you you know, um, just be careful. Um, if you notice any kind of wisps of smoke or any kind of fuming from that, please, you know, stay away from it. Again, they're not going to explode. It's not going to blow up. But, you know, some of the gases that can be given off from the uh, chemical, it's an electrochemical reaction inside the battery cell and it, through the decomposition can be kind of toxic. Um, no, you don't need to evacuate in a four block area or do a shelter in place. It's just, it's just pay attention and, st you know, stay out of the fumes. Um, but I hope that, that answers that question, the insurance adjuster who was on the call. I think I, I added to his question that was in the chat on equipment that you might think about procuring. And certainly, you know, we make recommendations in our training that if you haven't thought about getting metal tow chains, certainly those are, you know, standard equipment for tow truck operators, but Perhaps think about putting that in the back of your apparatus or your response trucks as a means to move, segregate, separate an electric vehicle if it's in a TIM situation or you need to clear the roadway. The other thing we're highly recommending people consider procuring for your departments, your agencies, your own personal safety is a thermal imaging camera. So you'll be hit heat signatures if a battery is still unstable and it's still showing you know, evidence of heat and smoke and smell and everything else, but a tick and metal tow chains, you know, will give you information on whether that thermal event is ongoing or needs to be cooled with some more water or left alone to consume itself. 
Yeah, and I also to echo what Joe said about a tick, make sure you understand that a tick, you're not, you're not trying to get the car down to 70 degrees. You keep the temperature down below in, you know, trainings I do 140 to 170 degrees, keep it below that you're, you, and just monitor it. A lot of times, you know, the second or third time you cool it down, you're, you're going to be quite effective in getting it. Um, it's a, again, it's electrochemical reaction inside the battery. Um, you know, but you want to make sure the tick is looking at the battery. You're not, Back, you're not up here looking at the door. And you also have to realize you may be looking at something that's the size of a baseball or the size of a softball. That's where the thermal runaway may be, may be occurring. And that's where you want to put the water, not over the whole battery, but just that one spot. <clears throat> and I certainly don't recommend using a piercing nozzle into the battery compartment. That's bad. <laughs> uh, I, I like to use a uh, 10 minutes to Wapner bad. That's very bad. Don't use a piercing nozzle. Um, I've seen a department that just simply takes a monitor and puts a nozzle on it, puts it right up underneath. So it's coating the bottom of the car. And they said it worked very effectively on an incident they had. Um, but make sure you're, you're trained on the use of the tick. Make sure you're looking on the thing. The only other piece of equipment that I would recommend that you, you consider getting to add to Joe's thing is some kind of monitoring of the atmosphere, uh, a four gas meter. Um, and if you can, if you're blessed enough to be able to get like an HF meter or something like that to monitor, um, you know, the gases and, and make sure you wear your PPE, make sure you wear your PPE. Um, we see it all the time. People get hurt because they don't wear their PPE. You know, the NVFC promotes best behavior, equipment, standards, and training. Joe's talked about standards. Make sure you're following the standards on it. Um, people ask me all the time about what about the runoff from these? No, the runoff's not a big concern. Um, I haven't seen any study that shows that the runoff is extremely toxic or poses any, you know, you know, land ban substance or reportable quantity issues with regard to EPA or regulatory authorities. Joe, I, Mr. McLean, I don't know if you've seen that or not. I haven't seen anything like that. Seen one. I've you've seen, seen one? one? Yeah. It was no more a, significant yeah. than, uh, you know, gasoline or oil. Or yeah. 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 Towing recovery yard where it reignited and uh, the, the the local environmental folks got involved and they, they wound up having to do some abatement work uh, for runoff. Uh, but but you also have to understand towing, towing and recovery yards may be regulated under a different regulatory authority than we are out on the, yeah, on the highway. Could yeah, it could be. I, I don't, I don't know. Them. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, but I, you know, I've been a purveyor of mud hole chemistry for 35 years and I haven't seen any issue, big concerns about runoff. But again, like like Joe said, make sure you get the equipment and 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 the metal toe change, you know. But make sure you're anchoring to the right point on the car. They have they have built-in tow hooks. They have they have anchor points. They have places for the T bar. Uh, if, if not, you need to do a field from your local record. Break out a back window, right? I mean, you can you can yeah. yank something out by you know forcing an entry. I mean, if it doesn't have tow hooks and you don't want to screw in an eyelet on the tow, then get that thing out of whatever structure or any, you know, environment that you may want to protect continued loss of property damage. I mean, these are, these are things that attacking fires, every, you know, presentation of a fire is different, but. And, and in a motor vehicle crash where you may notice whiffs of smoke, keep in mind, you're going to see whiffs of smoke or, you know, everybody's, I wish I had a nickel for every time someone saw a car wreck where the radiator steaming, they called in said a car was on fire and the car really wasn't on fire. It's just steam. You want to look for whistle of smoke where you traditionally do not see whistle of smoke coming out from a wheel well, something like that. And it's a very distinct thing. And once you see it, you'll think, you know, if you have patients inside the car, get the patients out of the car, and move, remove them away, isolate the key fobs, get the key fobs away from the vehicle, you know, um, and try and, you know, like he, like Joe mentioned, Mr. McLean mentioned, disconnect the 12 volt battery system or pull the battery disconnect. We're, in our operations level class, we teach people how to do that with a pipe pole. We teach them where to look for it. You know, don't cut the high voltage cables. That's bad, very bad. <laughs> and Joe, I will disagree with you there. There you will get some arcing. I, I, I have, but that's again, from us not using the proper equipment. So Joe, I will tell you, that's where you can get an arcing situation. Um, or beware if that if that high voltage cable is impinged on something like a guardrail or something like that, or there's been penetration from some type of metal object. Um, again, that's a boots on the ground experience thing. Um, but, but you know, make sure that you're you're paying attention. 
but treat these in most cases are 99% similar to any other vehicle that you're going to deal with. Um, and that's, but that goes back to training and, and, and making sure that your people are competent, making sure they're ready to hit the ground. Um, and like I said, I appreciate everyone being on the panel today. I especially want to thank Joe from Federal Highway and, and Mr. McLean from GM. I appreciate, you know, their partnerships with all of the fire service organizations and working on getting the information out to the boots on the ground. And hopefully we can, you know, we're, we're going to keep trying to get the information out to you folks. And we appreciate you taking up your time and we're about 15 minutes over, but thank you. Well, Tom, thank you. You closed out the session for me. <laughs> but uh, I do want to thank everyone. And we are 15 minutes over. Um, there may have been one or two questions that we weren't able to get to. Please send those to Matthew so we can get them out to the uh, correct panelists um, to get those questions answered for you. Um, just do a, a quick plug for the MBFC. We are the leading nonprofit membership association representing the interests of all of these uh, emergency responders out there. Um, we do provide resources, training, advocacy, and programs to help um, you all thrive. So you can learn more about us and join at mbfc.org and mbfc.org slash join. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will provide all of the resources that we discussed today. Um, and with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us on the panel. I want to thank the audience out there. I hope everyone got some great information to take back to their departments. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you all.